ladies and gentlemen, another episode of Quest Love Supreme. I'm your host, Quest Love. We got Team Supreme in the hit house, Fontigolo. Wow, new. If Bill Sherman were here, he would notice that you're in yet a another room in the house. Yeah, this is uh, my studio. It's just easier for me here. I normally record in my living room, but my son is doing virtual school down uh, stairs, so I just bring it upstairs to the studio. Do it here. Wait, virtual school is still going on, or is it optional now? It's well, we did, yeah, it's optional. We did it. <laughs> you know, what I mean? he'll, be <laughs> he'll be going back to classroom for his junior year, but for this year, it was just the numbers around here were crazy, so we put him in virtual. Smart. We gotta be smart, man. Uh, Steve, where are you at right now? I'm where you are in the 67 degrees at 30 Rock. We're freezing in 30 Rock right now. Yeah. Keep that, keep that COVID out. It's cold. I know. Yeah. Freeze the COVID out. Definitely. Uh, Laia, where are you at with your oh, you uh, black know. art behind you? Lemur all day. That's where I'm Yo, here. Yo, Laia, I forgot yeah. to tell you. You was here. I took my first visit to Lemur Park. You know what? I can't stand you. I, <laughs> do, I only had only had like. 35 minutes to, to run the Juneteenth. He was I, at I the felt, Juneteenth festival. I felt I was like there I was too. in a legit episode of Insecure, yo. Somebody told one, me they saw Black Thought. I thought they was lying. It was the most beautiful, like, experience I've ever had at a Black yeah. festival. Yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, I went, I went to uh, Juneteenth for half a second. Then I went to uh, the, the body roll party, like, in another side of L.A. Yeah, like Saturday, this- man. It was it was one of the nicest, blackest experiences I've ever had in Los Angeles. People so, don't know think- about that. I'm glad you said that. I forgot. Yeah, yeah you're you're a Lemur Parker. Did you enjoy yeah. it? I, I loved it. This was an amazing Juneteenth weekend. I mean, thank God we came through. It was looking sketchy for a minute because of Walmart and them, but it came right. through nicely. Oh, the damn yeah. ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Freedom for me. <laughs> You know, Bill, you know, Billy Higgins had the world stage there. Um, so you, you probably, if you, this is your first yeah. time in Lamert Park, you, yeah, then you never experienced that. But that was no really dope back in the day. I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, if we if we bring the festival back to Los Angeles, I think we're going to travel with it. So we're looking at like Texas and other spots. But Exclusive I definitely want to do another Juneteenth. Nice. Oh God! Did I? Yeah. I, yes, you well, did. Yes, you did. You did it. You did it. It's okay. Well, there's nothing exclusive about wanting to spread the Juneteenth love around. Anyway, y'all. Um, as I was saying, you know, I I would say that this year for me uh, has been an awesome list or an awesome year for bucket listing. Um, and I'm checking. I, I guess you could say I, I, I'm checking a lot of my uh, musical heroes, bringing them on the the show and nerding out on them. Our guest today is absolutely no exception. Um, I'll say that she's probably the first young person, male or female, the first young person that I ever saw on a drum set. Um, And I guess at the time when I first, I forget the name of the show, it was like on PBS, like Rebop or something like that. I, I forget what it was, but it was definitely one of those like local Boston uh shows or whatever and to see a young kid on a drum set definitely made uh uh an impression on me uh when i was a kid i forget what year it was like i was like six or seven when i first saw you i think you were like 12 13 or whatever um but she's literally done it all grammys uh college professor um two-time late night band leader um, activist, producer, um, collaborated with such uh, luminaries like uh, the great Clark Terry, Wayne Shorter, Herbie Hancock. I know that you have to be in the meditation if you if you have <laughs> <laughs> if you collaborate with those two. Um, Diana Reeves, Esperanza. Yeah, Esperanza Spalding, the whole Mosaic project with with, uh, you know, Diana Crawl and 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 the likes. Al Jarreau, Stan Getz, Clark Terry, Woody Shaw. I can go on and on and on. Uh, This has been a long time coming. Thank you for your patience because this this is one of these episodes where, you know, because of the courses and events of my life in the last month or so, I've had to put this off at least three or four times. You've been very patient. Finally, I can say, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Questlove Supreme, Terry Lynn Carrington. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure talking to you. 
I'm great. It's my pleasure talking to you. I'm a big fan and I love everything that you do. So the Yo, every time is mutual. We've we've never had a, a in-depth heart to heart like conversation. So whenever I hear through other people like, oh, you know, Terry says, what's up or whatever, you know, occasionally you've come by like I've seen you play a few gigs or whatever, and I'm still mind blown. Like there's there's always this this thing where, you know, jazz musicians are so not above the fray, but just like above whatever mm-hmm. is below them as far as pop music is concerned or whatever. Like it's all one thing. It's all black music. You know, true. Like, I mean, it all comes from the blues. So it, there was something something would be wrong with me if I didn't appreciate what you do. You well, know, thank so, you. <laughs> That would be like, if any, you know, if I had a jazz friend that you know, didn't appreciate you, I would be looking at them sideways. Well, I, I thank you for that. I appreciate it. Where, where are you talking to us right now from? You have a very interesting background. It oh, that's, uh, looks like a, a mall and a prison at the same time. <laughs> what is that? I, let, let me, uh, I have a few backgrounds. Um, I'm, I'm at home. Uh, but okay. that's just my Berkeley background. Here's another Berkeley background. Yes. Here's an animated one with, uh, I don't know, who's that? Toshiko Yoshi by Red and Alice Coltrane. Mm, Here's okay. one I just want to see Obama drop the mic. Mm. Here's <laughs> one I, when I'm missing my grandmother. <laughs> wow. Nice. Uh, okay. Here's our slogan. Uh, you can't really see it, but it's jazz without patriarchy. Oh, and this one you might recognize. This is from Soul, because, you know, I was a consultant on Soul. I don't know if yes. you knew it. I know. Yeah. I know. Like, they, they, they went above and beyond the call of duty did I ask every wow jazz luminary for their for their uh advice um yeah it was fun doing that I was at doing some meetings the first one Herbie was at and I was probably the only one in the room that you know might have a difference in opinion you know with Herbie and be able to actually say it you know right. what I mean because everybody gets scared so to uh, speak up right yeah you know wow I mean, That's my, good. my uh my Aww. biggest mentor <laughs> Man. So anyway, we just so, had him on the show. Shout out to Wayne Shorter. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I was going to say we. I, I was shocked at the amount of feedback we got for that particular episode. Like a lot of heavy jazz heads, yeah, hit us because- and kind of thanked us for asking questions that we norm like aren't normally asked. You know, in yeah. other interviews, and just letting him talk. That's what we did. We let him talk. Exactly. That's the right thing. <laughs> so I'm going to start with you, Terry, the way that I always start the episode. Can you tell me what your first musical memory was? Wow. You know, they happened so long ago that it's kind of like a movie that I'm a part of that I'm, I watched and it feels real because I watched it. But uh, was I really there? You know what I mean? Like I right. played uh, tambourine when I was five years old on stage with Rasson Roland Kirk. And that was probably the first time I was wow. on stage. You How many know, saxophones did he play? <laughs> Always, at least three. <laughs> Until he had a stroke. And then I would see him after that. And then he played with one hand, one saxophone. But he might have even worked too with the one hand. Right. You no. Know. But was um, any of that surreal to you? I mean, I, I'm with with most kids that I see, especially kids that are I guess you could say progeny of like other, I, I know that uh, your father and your grandfather um, were musicians as well. So oftentimes, you know, at least there's a realization moment of what you're really into, but that usually comes in your teens. But in the beginning, it's just like, hey, this is dad and this is granddad and here's some musicians around the house. Like, but yeah. did anything strike you odd about this you know, this this guy with dread or I don't know if he had dreadlocks back then, but I knew him when he had dreads. But playing three saxophones at the same time, like nothing seemed odd about that to you. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, when you're young, you don't really pay attention to all that. Like you're just doing you and I was having fun. So and I was getting attention. So I knew I was different from the other, uh, you know, elementary school kids that I was hanging out with because Ebony came to school to take pictures of me, you know. When mm-hmm. I was uh, 11. What a flex. Listen. <laughs> what was home yes. like after that? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. No, I mean, from the black kids, you know, there might have been, I don't know, six or seven in my class. So, of course, they knew what was happening. The other kids, I'm not sure they knew what Ebony was. But... <laughs> where, did, where did you grow up? Where were you born? 
in Medford, Massachusetts. Oh, hey. okay. how far is that from Boston? It's anyone outside of New England, like Massachusetts, just like Boston, and then a bunch of uh, <laughs> green, uh, green and Roxborough, and... where, where New Edition's from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roxborough. Roxbury. Roxbury. Oh, oh, yeah. damn. Boston, yeah. You grew up in Roxbury? Oh, no. hell no. <laughs> oh, phew. OK, I thought I could I like... you know, go to Roxbury, but my dad would remind me, you know, you're from West Medford, but our our um, area of town, West Medford, was the most heavily settled black area outside of Boston. Mm -hmm. um, so like, for instance, in my high school, was 4000 people in the high school, uh, close to 4000. And at the time when I was in high school, there were 365 black kids which is not quite even 10%, but when we had lunch, you know, I'm sitting with 200 black kids. So I, right. it felt like it was, you know, it was a black environment, you know, for our circle. Right. It was but just was, was Boston the South of the North? Again, like I'm so triggered by anything to do with Massachusetts. I just naturally think that Massachusetts is just one of these states that escaped the Confederate, you know, just based <laughs> on, what we've learned about it, but like in your childhood, was it was it like that at all? Or did you have experiences? Yeah. Or? I mean, I, I came like right after the busing situation and there was like a, a bit of a riot at my high school um, about, you know, surrounded by some kind of rape or about some kind of racial incident. Um, but that happened right before I got to high school. Um, and I mean, you know, I was going into Boston weekly, at least. I got a scholarship to Berkeley when I was 11. And uh, I was going weekly. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, was... you went to Berkeley while still in, <laughs> well, in yeah, I just went junior high school, correct? Well, 11, or elementary. So I was yeah, in elementary when I started. Yeah. But um, that I went once a week, um, so it wasn't like that big a deal. You know, I went after school once a week and took private lessons and ensemble and then, a you big know, deal. special <laughs> but what i mean is it wasn't like stressful Berkeley I wasn't reject. Academic. that's a big deal <laughs> well then that's their loss right and we try Damn to right. change i'm change not bitter all at that. all <laughs> <laughs> but what i must say though is um you know boston in, in a weird way is kind of the most liberal and conservative places you'll ever be it's a total you know dichotomy of, of mm -hmm. these things and um everybody hates the celtics and all that but you know nobody ever <laughs> talks about how uh we had the first black coach and one of the first black players um and you know hmm. i never thought that about the celtics for real yeah 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 you wow. Can wow so i'm just saying like there's a lot of things wrong racially with what's yeah. happened here, but you know, there's, it's, it's not all bad. And there were, you know, places uh, like where I grew up that had heavily populated black areas and it was very, you know, rich in culture. All right. So if, if ever the Patriots or the Celtics win again, I'll, yeah. I'll add you to my new edition pile. Like, okay, well, <laughs> at least you seven are happy. So <laughs> that universal health care, Amir, Massachusetts did that first too. Yes, for free health care. Right. Yep. 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 I um, mean, you know, if you're from a place, you, there's got to be some love. You know, like I used to, I used to hate to go to Philadelphia, <laughs> but oh, you know, I, I got, oh, I got, I got happier as I went. You know, so right. as I learned more about the city, really, you know, I used to not like Chicago. You know, whatever. Like you, you have these experiences, and it's just as you grow, you have the other experiences that make, can make a place have some nostalgia at the, at the very least you didn't like yeah. traveling in general or just yeah i mean well i liked it now i don't particularly care for it i have a love-hate relationship because i am happiest sometimes when i'm just in a hotel room mm. and can close the shades and you I know, know. Lock everybody out <laughs> <laughs> i know because i'm not dealing with oh i gotta fix this in my house you know, I come home and I get stressed. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta paint the house. I need a new roof. You know, all those right. things start kicking in, but whatever but way I can just, yeah, I can <laughs> just focus on whatever it is I'm doing. Um, Yo, can, can I ask a question? Cause I just want to know, you say from the jump jazz was in your life in the sense that like no other, you weren't, even as a kid in school. Cause I mean, you said Berkeley when you were 11. So I'm like, 
did anything else ever get into the household or into your ears outside of, of what okay yeah I mean I was I mean I listened to the radio and I listened to you know like my father started me off listening to what he would consider more rhythm and blues which okay. at the time we're talking about the early 70s um, but for him like he played in horn sections with James Brown and Ruth Brown and people like that when he was in college and um so that's the kind of music he started me off listening to because he thought I would be able to relate to that you mm. know more than John Coltrane or Miles right. Davis right. so I was listening to lots of organ you know lots of lots of blues Jack McDuff Jimmy McGriff and you know some rhythm and blues of course James Brown Ray, Ray, Ray Charles uh, Aretha Franklin and those are the records you know a lot of the records that I remember you know as a kid can you tell me the album that you purchased with the first album that you purchased with your own money? Ooh. Not just had around the house, like, oh, let me see what dad's James Brown's album or into, but like. Yeah, you know, like, I don't know if I purchased it, but I think I must have asked my parents to get uh, get it for me because I'm not sure they would have. For whatever reason, I was obsessed. And I remember I had one of those kids. Uh, it was green too. one of those kids. uh album uh phonograph players they had a right. speaker built in and you just <laughs> right you know, well, well, it, it, uh, post post pre preschool or whatever uh fisher price uh fisher price. record yeah, players yeah something i like feel that. like i know what this record or what was the record oh no it was um the fifth dimension yeah, oh, okay. it was uh, uh i was obsessed with uh aquarius uh oh wow yeah for some reason <laughs> okay. are you are you age one? of the aquarius huh I'm like are you one no, 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 I'm a Leo. Okay. Okay. <laughs> boss, All right, boss. I, for, I, I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> what, for that being the record? No, 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 no. I'm oh, just for being saying, a Leo? Uh, no, it's for being a Leo. Yeah. That's all. No. You get extra <laughs> points if you're an Aquarian. Uh, um, <clears throat> for, uh, for, yeah. for drumming, though, um, you know, I, I know that there's... Uh, a sect of people whose opinions are like, you know, for, at least for gender pairing, like there are instruments that um, it's probably deemed that men should use only as far as masculine or feminine, whatever, like this women on drums really it's it's it was, a, in my opinion, like a, an adjustment pre 1980s, but at all did anyone ever discourage you like well why don't you try the piano or maybe a guitar violin something. Yeah. yeah clarinet yeah i don't you know i don't know if anybody really ever discouraged me i um and i was you know i i, I was confident at a young age so uh like i think what tells the story about that for me the best is when i met Buddy Rich for the first time. I was 10 and I was a guest with Clark Terry. Was and, he nice to you? Well, that was the thing. Everybody said, stay away from him. He's in a really bad mood and I didn't care. And I went up to him anyway. And uh, so then somebody stepped in and said, well, let me introduce you to young Terry. She's a guest with Clark Terry. And he said, oh yeah, you better not be any good. And I just looked at him and said, well, who's gonna stop me? Ooh. Hey. And, Ooh. <laughs> and then Ooh. he said, he kind of took a step back and then he said, well, you want to come play with my band? Oh, I see what I mean. Nice. So, <laughs> flex. flex. No, but it, it, well, it wasn't that. It was just, beautiful flex. Well, yeah, because I think it's how you're raised. And, yeah. and I, I, I was raised that this is my music. And That's I, what I was, I, where did that confidence come from, Terry? Like, what, do you remember, like, did your parents something say to you, like the impetus of that? Like, I think it's who you are. And that's why I do so much um, gender equity work now because every woman shouldn't have to be like me. I will go head to head with any man. You know what I mean? And I'm, oh, I'm not yeah. intimidated by anyone. Um, I'm, okay. I, can be, I can be shy and I can be insecure. Of course, we're all insecure. If I was playing a gig next to you, I would be insecure, especially if I hadn't played Groove, I'd be like, oh man, oh, he's sitting next to me, damn. <laughs> That's she must crazy. be talking about Sugar all. Steve right now. Yo, that's crazy, Amir. I know. Let's talk about Sugar Steve and his engineering skills. Or <laughs> Fonte Ryman. <laughs> that's no, what I'm just about. saying. No, I'm serious. And so I'm just saying that doesn't mean I think you can be confident and that be a part of your personality, which doesn't mean there's these other things that you know aren't there as well. True. But you shouldn't have to be like me 
to make it. You know, you you shouldn't have to have that kind of personality as a woman right. to to have the opportunity or the access or mentorship or apprenticeships. And so that's you know when I realized that that's when I because I had been looking at women saying, well, what do you mean? Just do it. You know, like, what, what do you mean? Just what, later for them, you know, like right. somebody discovers you, that should give you more impetus to, you know, then I realized, you know, they have nervous breakdowns and shit, you mm-hmm. know, like, so I, 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 I had to look at it differently. Cause everybody doesn't have a foundation. Cause you still had some type of foundation to let you know that that is the way to think. And these women didn't have that. So, and they don't need to, that's the whole thing. We're all different. You know, we don't have to be, I I was nothing around nothing but men playing, you know, for a long time. And so I ended up kind of acting like them, you know, and not, (laughs) you know, having a problem being around men all the time. So I think that, uh, you know, we we should celebrate our differences and what does a woman's aesthetic sound like in the music? You know, I think Uh, that's the question we should start to ask. I'm I'm glad you I'm glad you shared that story. I don't think I've ever went record or went public uh on record with uh in high school I once had um a master class kind of uh session with a well-known uh patriarch of of jazz music. Um you know f- but I, I guess you could say he was a a, a, a total dick. <laughs> um, and, you know, that that's actually where I was leaning towards it. Like, especially there's a there's a generation. Of cats who were um, sort of in the game in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s who, um, you know, don't mince words at all. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't suffer any fools. They're very blatant and honest or whatever. And, this guy just tore me up, man. Like everything. I, I didn't even get on the set. And he just looked at the loud shirt I was wearing. Look at my hair. It's like, oh, see, you. I, I wouldn't hire you because your hair is just like a girl's right now. You know, with that, with them snakes in your hair or whatever. And like, he was just going in. And I remember like. After that day. That day, I like distinctively remember like. I'm not going the young lion route because, you know, I, I went to school with Christian McBride and Joey at Performing Arts High School. And so I was on that that sort of track every day trying to keep up with those two and become a young lion. Like, you know, because all those cats in Philly were just like even in high school, like doing sessions and whatnot. And I, you know, I had the opposite reaction. I actually that kind of like just got in my head and, you know. Maybe like a year later, that's when I decided, okay, I'm gonna go the roots route because, Mm -hmm. you know, he told me that I don't look like a serious jazz cat. And, you know, it's, (laughs) I'm, 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 and now you you can buy him. Right. I was about to say, well, where is he now? At least his masters. (laughs) No, no, this, this, you know, this, this guy's a, a legacy god in the world of jazz right now, you know no longer with us, but um, I don't know, like how, how important, well, I don't know if this is a real question, like how important you don't wanna, is you it don't to name mentor? His name, no. <laughs> you don't want to name his name? You're not with us anymore. Name? Hey dog, it was Ellis Marcellus. I'll just let it out. Oh, oh anyway. well, yeah, but he's dead. Well, didn't that make sense? <laughs> well, I just mean, I've, 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 I, you know, he was, you know, very kind to me, actually. Uh, he coached us once, but I've heard- I feel like you're a disarming others. person. I feel like at the age, to 10 you were very disarming with anyone that you met you know that would encourage you yeah and I think that that's helped you know with the gender equity work now because I'll get a lot of older musicians calling me saying you know I guess I've been an old fart or you know thanks for pointing this out um but you know the bottom line is you shouldn't have to be that and if people should recognize what they're doing and there are a lot of older musicians that basically bought into this you know patriarchy and brought into the bought into the hyper masculinity and mm-hmm. what i'm finding is there's a lot of young musicians uh from teaching at berkeley a lot of young male musicians that aren't digging the hyper masculinity so they actually come to our institute because some people get it twisted and think that our institute is for women musicians or non-binary musicians it's a space that they can come and 
and make mistakes and, and learn the music without uh, having their guard up. But right. we have about 50% uh, young men in our institute as well because they're rejecting the hyper-masculinity in, in jazz as well. And I think that we're really seeing a turning point right now. It's starting to really shift. And I think that the music needs that uh, for it to live up to its full potential. So let me ask you so as a professor wait, then, wait. this is a, about the patriarchy, because how do you, since it was a, a, a art form built on that, Right. Doesn't it come to a certain point where you're at an impasse in explaining and, you know, because I feel like we're in this point, too, of sometimes it's either that's what it was and we're trying to change it. Or how do we make, make that still legendary, even though that was a problem? Like, how do we keep that? Well, you know, the patriarchy was patriarchy was never good. It wasn't good for anybody. It right. Was white, white male patriarchy, to be specific. Um, but, you know, I think that the oppressed learn how to oppress without trying. It's just, you know, that's what happens. And I felt, I feel like this was, a, you know, this is just, you know, my opinion, but I feel like jazz was a space for, for black men to, uh, you know, really feel freedom. Right, black men. Yeah, exactly, you know, because I mean, well, well, you can go back, you know, I've talked to Angela Davis about this and, mm -hmm. and uh, different people because when slavery ended, you know, black people couldn't travel, right? They, you couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then when slavery ended and there was a little bit of freedom, the first one I think that people took advantage of was being able to move, you know, being able to, to, to go to another town and, and, you know, whether you're playing on the street or in a juke joint or wherever, you could bring your guitar and you could, but it wasn't safe still for women to do that right uh, okay okay and, okay and and these places were not places uh respectable women should women should be in but they were right? there enjoying the music though they yeah but not all women you know, right, right, right. You know there, there certain types of, of women brothels <laughs> and, right 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 so the music you. was in these places right so yeah so it was that's what the music kind of that where it was birthed right so it wasn't it was it wasn't spaces necessarily for women to discover their artistic uh, you know they, they discover that they could actually do this. Mm -hmm. um, so they were always off to the side in the house in the church wherever you know and of course playing piano and that's why I think that's so acceptable you know women always play piano in the house in the church right. Mm -hmm. um, so then when women started traveling and getting into you know music and the blues. A lot of it was uh, as singers, right? As vocalists. Then you had like, you know, Bessie Smith and um, uh, uh, Mamie Smith, and you know some of the first blues women, uh, Ma Rainey. Uh, that, well, yeah, but she was later. She was, okay. uh, yeah, but th th they became also um, like sexualized, and and mm -hmm. they had, you know, they were entertainers. You know, it wasn't necessarily as considered serious work. The musicians, musicians were it wasn't doing considered serious. Yeah. Well, it was not just, yeah, it was not work. You know, it was like, let's uh, commodify this. We can commodify this, you know, woman standing up front singing the blues more than we can commodify the dude with the guitar mm. kind of singing the blues. So, so those blues singers, the women, they sold more records, you mm. know? Okay. But Bessie Smith was selling, yeah. So my point is, it started off like that. And, uh, you know, then later, of course, in the 40s, when the war happened, all the women emerged playing because so many men were gone. Going to war, right. What blows my mind is that when they came back from the war, uh, it seemed like some women disappeared. Mm. You know, it came back to the, you know, those practices. And none of this really, you know, surprises me. Like when I look up, uh, I, I I was ignorant to the story of Liberia, and I just kind of find out found out about that over the about last... the return. As far yeah, as the return. Oh. yeah, and like when I saw some footage uh, of all the, the black people with the top hats and looking trying to look British, and then <laughs> colonizing basically the Africans, right. I'm like, well, why would I expect anything different in jazz? I mean, mm. you know what I mean? It's kind of or in music, you know, it's like when you're oppressed. You just like that. You, you know, take that blueprint. Yeah, exactly. Without even knowing it's yeah. wrong. Knowing that you're doing it. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I was going to ask, like, do you feel like the age 
of the abusive, like in, in where we are now, um, like hip hop is, is changing. Um, where, you know, there's a sort of like a, a, a slow sea change of a lot of toxic attitudes that were long associated with hip hop. You know, we're now just starting to see the seeds of it growing. And, you know, I will, will assume that if it's still a thing in the 50s and 60s, 2050, 2060, uh, that we'll see a total turnaround. But like kind of the the age of the abusive um, sort of like uh, actor and whiplash. Yes. J.K. Simmons. I'm sorry. J.K. Simmons, that, that, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, how abusive he was in whiplash. When you seen that, it was was that to you? Was it triggering? Yeah, I didn't see Whiplash, you know. Um, what? When Whiplash came out, literally everyone asked me about it. Were, did yeah, people there's the other one about the drummer too, right? The one that lost his hearing. I didn't see that. Oh, oh, my oh God. yeah. Oh, that was the one with uh, your boy. Um, uh, Ray, I'm about to say Freddie Mercury. Uh, yeah, but. Uh, I saw that, but. <laughs> No, but yeah, 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 yeah we're gonna fall the in the album. vicious rabbit hole. God, that the one with the guy that lost his hearing that the sound of metal that's the name of sound it. Of metal, yes. Yes. That movie is amazing. Yeah, I have so many thoughts, you know, about that. Uh, but the first one that just came to my mind is, um, damn, how do I say this? No, say it correct. I just mean, like, you know, I, 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 I'm not so attracted to, uh, you know white dude suffering from some drum lessons. It just feels a little like <laughs> different, different. God <laughs> damn, that's straight from the book of fun. Hey. <laughs> trauma. White trauma. I just mean like, yeah, you know, so like for me, like there's a lot more suffering that I'm gonna focus on. Yeah. If I spend any part of my day dealing with that. Um, I'm glad they made a movie and the drums are in, the, in it and that people liked it, but um, you know, he could walk away probably a lot easier than, you know, somebody else. And he actually, if you, you know, historically, he had all the tools to, you know, fight back a little more than some of us. So mm -hmm. I right. don't know. But anyway, uh, wow. just as far as that whole method of teaching, <laughs> I mean, yeah, this, this, of course, you, like I had a, like a well-known drummer <laughs> who's passed away and who was my teacher and he threw a book at me once. But Shit. he said, um, you know, was, he, he was frustrated with his career and he quit teaching right after that. He was teaching at Berkeley and he said, you're playing my shit. You're not supposed to play my shit. And then he <laughs> threw a book at me. Yeah. You know? that's, that's, I was just thinking that's got to be something for all these. I got to know. Please, I, I share my name. You share your name. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. I mean, it's OK, because I, I, I saw him and we, you know, had a beautiful time hanging out before, you know, shortly before he passed and he was living in Europe and it was Keith Copeland. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's like I, I didn't even I, I loved him and I felt like he loved me. And I never I think my parents were a little more upset about it than me, you know, because I just. I shrugged it off, you know, that was, I think that's been my way. And that's another thing I just want to point out since we're talking about it, everything that's happened, like anything negative, I've had to shrug it off. You know what I mean? Like I, I couldn't really deal for me. I had to just act like it didn't happen and keep moving mm -hmm. and, you know, being in my brain, oh, that's not going to stop me. You know what I mean? Like, you, right. and so then you look back and it's hard, you know, you start thinking like when I started playing with um, Esperanza and Jerry Allen, they started talking about, oh, this feels good. Like this is a space where, man, I can let my hair down. I don't have, you know, I, I'm not, um, what's the word? Uh, you know, there's a like a protective layer. You know, Safe armor. space. Well, I'm, I was trying to think of how Esperanza put it and um, she started talking about an armor that she mm -hmm. was able to let go of. And then Jerry was agreeing and I was the only one sitting there saying, hmm, like really? Oh, okay, cool. Well, you know, whatever works for you. It took me years after that to understand oh I, I i have those issues too but i just sweep them under the rug oh, so well okay that I, I don't deal with it because it's just it's not useful to me i you know, thought you was like the most free individual i ever met yeah i was, I was like, about to say this is very unusual yeah <laughs> what do you mean free? no i i, I oh you talking about Esperanza? so many well i'm just saying so many people plant seeds and, you know, they plant seeds of doubt in your head and you live with it. And I just love the fact that 
that wasn't even like you just ducked it like a boxer. But it goes somewhere. Exactly. Right? It goes that's somewhere. So that's what she's saying. That's why I know. That's why I take oh. back what I said. Because I'm like, oh, she puts it somewhere. It ain't. Yeah. Well, I mean, I wasn't conscious of it, though. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm saying? And so that's just a layer that it's the way I see it is it's hard enough to learn how to play music, any kind of music. But jazz, I mean, it's really fucking hard. Right. So who wants that extra burden? Who wants that extra layer of, oh, and I have to deal with this. You know, like somebody hit on, you know, I don't, I didn't get hit on a whole lot, uh, you know, without wanting to, <laughs> but you know, if, if a band leader hit on me in the middle of rehearsal or, you know, I, I would just be like, oh, oh man, really? Good. Well, you know, fantasies are good. Let's go back to playing, you know, whatever. <laughs> and I yeah. never thought for one minute, I'm thinking of somebody and I'll, I'll say it, it was Stan Getz. And I never thought for a minute that it meant that I would lose the gig. And then when I start talking to these young people, all of that is going through their brain. Yes. Yes. All of it's going through their brain and they're not standing for it. Well, no, but now, but I'm yeah, talking now. about five, 10 years ago. Oh yeah. No, we just yeah. had to suck it up. You just suck. You just, yeah, you just. But they were you. wondering, well, what do I do? Like, yeah. This, uh, yeah. you know, am I going to lose the gig or, you know, how right. do I, and they started thinking, I realized, wow, that never crossed my mind. I told him, get out of here, let's go rehearse. You know, and it never crossed my mind that he would hold it against me. So that means technically you've never been disappointed by your hero in that way? Oh, maybe not in that way. You know, not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had a flashback. But even that, you know, like if somebody, you know, you you know somebody's over your house you come out and they're like sitting there naked or something you know even that would make me laugh you know <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> don't it depend on the legend it could be real sad though terry it could be like damn come on man <laughs> yeah but you know there's a lot of love and i think that um black women have have historically taken in uh, yeah, consideration all of these things right. and like as long as i don't feel like you know you're about to physically harm me right then i'm not really worried about it you know but what i'm right. what i keep trying to say is you shouldn't have to be that way you shouldn't, shouldn't. Have to go through the extra burden and that's what i will then take somebody down for so i have to talk myself off a ledge now all the time but that's for other people, for some of my students. I'm like, they say, what? And I'm like trying to go to the, run to the school to beat somebody down. I'm like, okay, we can't do that. Right. You know, I got to like now try to intelligently talk to this person hmm. or use language. Yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> Terry, I always wanted to know. Um, okay, so me, myself, I, I consider simply because I'm 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 so drenched in hip hop. Um, I have to be a shapeshifter. In other words, um, any track I hear, my first question I'm asking is, how would DJ Premier program this? Or how would Steve Ferroni drum on this? Or how would Tony Williams play this or whatever? Um, so oftentimes, you know, I'm shapeshifting kind of in the, in the name of, of being a human sampler. Uh, but when you're starting to drum, who is the who's the drummer who sound that you were more uh, most attracted to uh, when you first started um, based on, you know, uh, you, were, you left Arsenio, I think, in 89. So uh, based based on your symbol work, I always thought that Tony Williams might have been your North Star. But, you know, for you, who, who were your, your three gods of drumming that you had in your mind when you were drumming? Well, at the end of the day, it became, well, let me see. When I was 18, 17, uh, it was Jack DeJanet, and he became my biggest mentor. Uh, I purposely stayed away from trying to mimic Tony Williams. Uh, and Elvin Jones to a degree too, because their styles are so individual that if I hear somebody playing like them, it sounds like a caricature of them, you know? And 
more so than even, anybody else, I think, because their so, styles are so strong. So even when you're playing with with Herbie or Wayne or Combo, it's the temptation to not go well, there doesn't hit you at all. No, it it unfortunately uh, when I play with Herbie, especially in the earlier years. Well, see, the thing is, you know, I played in six or seven different bands of Herbie's. So it, you know, right, depending on what project yeah, is exactly. So the right. first. The, the first long, you know, term gig I had with him, we were supporting This Is The Drum. And then I had to play these grooves like with uh, with computers, right. you know, which I had never done. Uh, and then, uh, you know, trio, quartet, and, and then um, Gershwin's World, just those were more acoustic. But then um, the, uh, the Future to Future, mm -hmm. which, you know, it was more, uh, it had, you know, some hybrid hip hop stuff in there as well. But it was right. all, you know, mostly groove. Um, so when I was playing straight ahead in the beginning, yeah, Tony Williams would creep out because I realized whenever I heard Herbie from all the records, it was mostly Tony playing with him. So that is the sound, you know, that my spirit related to, to Herbie, which was interesting because he told me that Jack DeJanette was his favorite drummer. And that's like my guy. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. And so, that's Tony, my guy. So, so Tony, so Tony. So Jack DeJanette was Tony's sort of North Star as, as far as... No, 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 I'm saying Herbie told me... Oh, Herbie was said that. ...that Jack was his favorite drummer. Over and Tony? Yeah, that's what he told me. Wow, um, okay. To play with. This is, you know, after, you know, many years after that classic right. Miles Davis Quintet. So he, if you notice, <clears> I mean, he hired Jack on, you know, some of his records. and But anyway, uh, so I thought, oh, this that's my guy. So I'm good. You know, that's great. That's who I, that's my North Star. Mm -hmm. But then once I started playing, <laughs> all this Tony snuck in, you know, which is interesting just because having heard him with Herbie all those years. Uh, but what is, uh, what is Jack's? That's one thing I I would know him. Like there's some drummers where you instantly, even my eyes closed, you instantly know who's drumming. Mm -hmm. What is because of a lot of the Jack stuff that I heard was more like fusion, like his 70s fusion work or whatever. I, how oh. what's his like for me tony yeah. is so heavy on symbol work mm -hmm. that well, you he, automatically and his ability to stop time and just you know for for our listeners today that you know um i i guess you can say that sort of the way that chris dave's relationship with time where mm -hmm. you know he it doesn't exist in his world but it exists but it doesn't exist Tony was sort of, you know, that way straight ahead. But what, what do you think that Jack's trademark was? Well, I think I, I disagree a little bit about Tony in a time existing and not existing because I feel like, uh, you know, Tony's uh, beat was pretty, it was beautiful. It was so beautiful, mm -hmm. um, his time feel. But oh, was no, he certain... would stay on rhythm, but do yeah, all these counter it, rhythms that. Yeah, but that's to me mathematics. You know what I mean? Like the counter rhythms, it's polyrhythms. It's things that that work within the structure of, of a beat. And so what attracted me to Jack was the opposite of that. You know, the, the, the time being elastic. And, and, and like I hear him on this all, it's slinky like a snake, you know? It's um, in his touch, you know, I can tell Jack within a second of hearing him, you know, on any recording because it's his touch. Any great drummer, you're right, it's the ride symbol. You know, any great jazz drummer, their, their uh, identity lives in their ride symbol. Now, some, some people like Tony, like a lot of great drummers, like Tony, like uh, Art Blakey, uh, Max Roach, also part of their identity is uh, what they've, you know, developed soloing. So they're, they're licks, they're things that are signature, right? So mm -hmm. there are signature licks that you can say that Art Blakey or Tony Williams or Philly Joe Jones. Uh, but with Jack, it's not really signature licks. There's no licks. It's like, it's all more organic. And the same thing, all of my favorite drummers, Roy Haynes, it, it all begins and ends with Roy Haynes. He's the hippest jazz drummer. Oh, I'm, so glad, I'm so glad you said that. Oh God, my dad would be so glad you said that. <laughs> I just, I'm, literally yeah. he said to me about Terry, that's what he's, when I, 
I just want to say this real quick. I'm so sorry to mean to interrupt y'all, but for some of us, 89 is when you ended Arsenio. It's a whole generation of other folks that go, like from my father who go, Lil Terry, that was Roy Haynes' protege and all of that. So it'll just, <laughs> for me, I'm go, continue on Terry. I apologize. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. You, you know, just a sidebar, his son sent me a video last night of his granddaughter, which would be Roy's great granddaughter. They had been asking, she had been asking for sticks and he finally bought the, this little kid, she's three. Little kid set and sticks. And it was the first and time she ever held a pair of sticks. And she was like, blah, blah, blah. and she it's, ended and flipped the sticks and put them under her arm. He was like, you're what? the first person I'm sending this to. <laughs> for, for our listeners that don't know, uh, Roy Haynes is probably the, the elder statesman, I think, between him. Uh, Roy is 97 or 98. Still playing. Still wow. playing like Still he's playing. 40 something. Yes. That's crazy. Like it's nothing, yes. you know, and. You know, and, and with and his son, uh, Graham and, and whatever, like Graham literally. Craig. Yes. Just I should mention he, he taught my dad, too. That's why it's so important to him, too. Drumming geniuses. Yeah. Can I, can I? His name is Ron St. Clair, but my dad uh, had a nephew that he taught named Dennis Davis. So we're just a family. Oh, I know Dennis. Like, I, know, yeah. I knew Dennis. Yes. Yeah. Dennis that played with Stevie. Yes, Dennis Stevie. Is playing by himself, man. He's playing by himself, man. Dennis is playing by himself, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And he had the glasses on the. Um, he wore this... glasses on the. On the string. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can I? But I just want to say also Marcus. Oh. Marcus, Marcus Miller. No, 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 Marcus. Marcus Gilmore, Roy's yeah. nephew, right? Ah. Like, so it's all in the blood. That's all I want to say. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, no, epigenetics is strong. Um, can you? Okay, so I guess I one of the most grandson. I'm sorry, I can't go on record saying his nephew, his grandson. His grandson, yes. Yeah, Grant, uh, Roy Haynes, and then Graham Haynes, and then Marcus Gilmore. Wow. And now the, the daughter's three years old. So well, Graham plays trumpet, you know, but uh, Craig, his son Craig plays drums. Good gracious. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, Jesus Christ. Graham is on my first record. What I first record? The Do you want more? That's that's uh, Graham, uh, Greg Osby, Steve Coleman, or Mel and My Osby. Man. Wow. Uh, that swept was my away, Like all, all the horns that are on Do You Want More? What was your roommate? Greg Osby. Yeah, that was Greg like my roommate in Fort wow. Green. We were you were you part years. of uh, uh, what's M-Base? M-Base. <laughs> Were you part of the M base circle? Yeah, I was there when Steve named it. Like he said, I came up with this thing, you know, macro dash basic array of structural extemporizations. <laughs> and I was minute. like, good luck. Dude. Let's see if that's going anywhere. <laughs> I, wait, I did not know M base was an acronym. What is it for? Macro dash basic array of structural extemporizations. Ooh. Deep. <laughs> <laughs> But wow. yeah, we have a we did a record, um, which I think was really the beginning of M Base that never came out. Uh, it was for Grandma Vision, and uh, it was Graham. The horn section was Graham, Greg Osby, Steve, and uh, uh, who am I missing? It was four. Oh, Robin Eubanks. And then the, the rhythm section was Vernon Reed, Jerry Allen, me, Vernon. and Kevin Harris. Yeah. I, I I have so many. Oh man, you just opened up a door because, um, one of the questions I always had of like, I I had a manager, um, who was one of the top jazz DJs at uh Temple, uh RTI in Philadelphia, and you know, in his mind, like M bass was the future which is the reason why like a lot of the in bass including like cassandra and everybody like was on our first few records um and you know in his mind well you know to my impressionable at the time 17 18 year old mind you know when you're when you're a teenager you're just taking in anything you're not cynical you're not questioning anything and he hated the state of what jazz was at the time you know and at that point you know, Tane, Tane was was a hero of mine, of course, like everybody was gunning for the next Winton thing. And he was trying to explain to me in ways that I could understand. He was sort of like, yo, man, like I see Winton as Diddy just in terms of like, you know, with with 
if if you know the history of how Stanley Crouch was and and his critique of jazz, him sort of like, no, we got to go back to the '40s and stay in that level of of bop and only that. And he felt like M bass between the work that David Murray was doing, the work that M bass was doing, trying to push the envelope forward, and yet there's a kind of a, a, a an authority whatever like I, I guess you could imagine that that committee in flash dance that she's auditioning for like whoever in his mind is the authority of jazz sort of keeping back who should have been the next movement of jazz right. in the late 80s and and 90s and you know people just sticking to kind of like broadway like they're stuck in this tin pan alley loop between the 40s and and the 60s and right. thus forcing a lot of those people to do other things to survive, i.e. late night band leading and whatnot. Did you, at the time when you're in this movement, did you feel as though like, okay, we are the new generation. We're the native tongues. We're going to, you know, push forward. How, how much pushback at the time from like jazz traditionalists were you getting? Uh, uh, well, you know, when that started, um, like, I moved shortly thereafter to LA to do the Arsenio Hall show. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I was moving anyway, and then I got the show and that just made my move have to happen in a week. I was out there looking for apartments. I was staying with Patrice Russian and um, I was- What was the with... audition process like? You you just dropped a lot in that one sentence. You so. sure did. P.S. another former yeah. guest of Questlove Supreme. Yes, Patrice. indeed. Right, right, right. Our girl. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, so I was playing with Wayne Shorter at, at the time. so. And Diane Reeves was my best friend. She lived in LA. She, I met her at that same time when I, Clark Terry. So she was 19 and I was 10. We were both guests with Clark that time when I told you about the Buddy Rich story. Yeah. So when I went to LA and I, you know rehearsed with Wayne or we went to Japan, I would just stop in LA and stay for a while and stay with Diane and then and Patrice. And uh, Patrice, she was on um, Joyrider you know, with us. So it was around that time. And so the three of them convinced me to move to LA. So I, this was the end of uh, 88. So I went uh, right around Thanksgiving to LA and looked for an apartment. And then somehow it was Narda Michael Walden and Patrice, and maybe one other person that recommended me for the Arsenio Hall show. And so I went in and I just played a couple of tunes with them and, and I got the gig, but they were like, you gotta be back here next week. We start take, you know, we start next week, the day after New Year's. Uh, so I had a week to go home and pack up um, in Fort Greene and, and move to Glendale, California. Oh. But, um, yeah, and I, I, I stayed with Patrice while I was looking. Um, but uh, so the audition process wasn't very, I don't even know how many drummers they had. They had mm -hmm. audition. Uh, but oh, Standard, sorry. okay, can you play junk? Keep play funk, keep play jazz, keep play. You yeah, know. and you know, Michael Wolf was in. Michael so it Wolf. Wasn't, it right. wasn't any heavy funk, you know what I mean? It wasn't any, and you know, the, the, John B was on, on on bass, you know, so it wasn't. Um, yeah, but it was a good, a great experience, you know, and I feel like it set me up, you know, more for doing the vibe TV show with Ray Filling Games, and that That's was, right. yeah. you know, more. Um, more of a, of a band that could play with anybody. So like we play with James Brown, we play with Aaliyah, we play with uh, Destiny's Child, we play right. with, uh, I don't know, Rick James. We play with, you know, just a lot of, it was an amazing experience playing with all those people. Whereas the first one, we didn't really play with that many people that came on. But I, you were saying something else. Um, you were, I, I fell down a whole, uh, well, the M base. Uh... Oh, M base, yeah. So what happened was, they were moving on and when I look back and like the, when that record we made everybody had to bring in a song and Steve had made this um like kind of criteria for the music of it not being straight ahead and having you know rhythms or grooves kind of from more modern because he was into James Brown but mm -hmm. you know more modern grooves but with um harmony and stuff moving like jazz but not necessarily in the traditional kind of two five one way um right. and and things that weren't in that kind of form like no aaba forms and that kind of thing right. so what i wrote was more popish so to say and if you if you were to listen to it like my song was the outlier on the record because 
I listened to everything he said and I did everything literally in these little sections, odd time signatures or whatever. And, but it really pointed to something more commercial, so to say, mm -hmm. than their writing. And, um, you know, I know so many, it was like a potpourri of music, which was probably good that the record never came out. But, um, so I didn't feel so connected. I feel like I was there in the beginning, but I wasn't super connected and I was playing with Wayne and I was really just trying to do that gig because I hadn't really played um, a fusion gig. Like when I auditioned for Wayne, there was 14 drummers and you know, I got the gig somehow. <laughs> and that was my first real uh, foray into just you know, playing group stuff. But I had been listening, of course, to Weather Report and, and all of that. And you know, coming up, I mean, Earth, Wind & Fire was my favorite band. Uh, mm -hmm. You had asked earlier if I was listening to all this other music. I mean, I remember the first place I, I was when I heard Go-Go at a party. And, Excuse um, me? Where'd you hear Go-Go at a party in, in, in Massachusetts? In West Medford, in Medford. Where I what? Said it was a black community. With, see, it's not. I know, but it's so, go -Go's so localized. That's why I'm like, it made it up there? Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Chuck Brown. And then I remember the first time, you know, I was at another one of those parties and I heard Rapper's Delight. You know, it was my first introduction to hip hop. I didn't know what was happening before that. Right. But, Is that enough? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, so like I was listening to all of that stuff coming up. Um, and, you know, I, I just as a sidebar, uh, I was in Beat Street. So I feel like I was actually. Oh, wait, 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 uh, wait, wait, stop, wait, stop. Hold on. Come back. You didn't know that? No. no. <laughs> yeah, I'll send you a little clip. It was just a, like a quick cameo. But wait, um, when when they were doing the ballet thing on stage. Yep. Was it was uh, a rainbow thing. Oh. Oh, yeah, but right. I was brought in from Medford, Massachusetts by Harry Belafonte Harry. to play like this little drum fill. Basically. I'm sorry. These sentences are so compound that you give. I'm so I sorry. Know. I was spotted oh, by Harry Belafonte for the Beach Street cameo. Oh, but because, yeah, because he was the producer of Beach Street. And Diane forgot Reed about that too. Was, was playing in his band. So I had made an album that's actually going to come out 40 years later now uh, with Kenny Barron, Buster Williams, and George Coleman. And I was, I was uh, 16 at mm. the time. So we had just done it. So at this point now I'm 17. And uh, <sighs> Diane came to Boston with Harry. So I hadn't seen her since this Wichita Festival when I was 10. So we had a big reunion. And she, I gave her this tape of my album. It was a green cassette tape. And mm. she gave it to Harry. And then out of the blue, he just called. And we thought it was a joke, you know? Um, there's a couple of people that called we thought it was a joke. Benny Goodman called once too. We definitely thought that was a joke. But <laughs> it was. And you just hang up on him like <laughs> Yeah, but Harry though, yeah, we were like, Stop come playing on. on my phone. Amir, you are making the wrong movies around the wrong movie. people. I'm like, when is this movie Yo, come out? This I'm is I'm literally, a I'm literally well, okay. I'm watching the scene right now. I'm yeah, sorry. We, I, I yeah, had to pull it up on my monitor. Yeah, no, yeah. I was wow. I was you know, talking about my Terry Lynn Carrington movie about her life because it's, I've oh. never, never in my whole, there's never been a, never, never. Oh. This, this yeah, is you crazy. know, it's funny. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. So I feel like, you know, like on some weird, in some weird way, that was, um, you know, I was the word I'm looking for. That was kind of predicting, you know, I've always felt connected to all the genres. Genres, yeah. I've always been a bit of a bridge, you know, with all the genres. You have. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, well, just because I mean I'm a jazz head, of course, but I mean I went through many years when I lived in LA saying, "Don't call me a jazz musician." You know, I'm just a musician. Then you know I had to come back. You know, <laughs> like my dad was mm. like, "You can't run away from who you are." Yeah. And uh, yeah. And also, okay. you stay collaborating with folks, so I'm like, I know you still got your ear to the streets because you know yeah, you still I'm got folks like Rhapsody doing... on records and whatnot. So. Yeah, I'm doing a &R now for uh, Candid, which is an old label um, that John Burke and the team that he's with at uh, Accel uh, Acceleration Music, they're buying labels. They bought uh, Alligator Records, they bought Candid, they mm -hmm. bought a hip hop label too. So I'm doing, you know, it's a dream that I always wanted. I always wanted to do, I read Hitman back in the day and I wanted to do a &R. Uh, yeah. And one day I was walking and I said, well, that's one, Wait, you know. You read Hitman and then still wanted to be in the industry? <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was what I wanted to do. <laughs> that would have been the red light to be like, nah, don't don't come here. So you wait, know, what do you I wanted to no, you know, I wanted to be Clive Davis. I wanted to wow. be, you know, like and so I felt like, you know, there was only two black women, 
you know, that we're doing, we're doing that, right? Suzanne DePass and um, uh, Sylvia Rome. I'm about to say Sylvia, Sylvia but young, yeah, yeah you know, younger. Hitman, you know. So when people ask me about glass ceilings, that's what I say. As a yeah. producer, as an A&R person, those are the places I, I felt more of a glass ceiling than, than playing the drums necessarily. Interesting. You know? So oh, now- getting in the industry. Like yeah. you ain't got the ears, like you ain't got the ears? Yeah, like, like I mean, or like I'm in some little jazz box over here that, you know, because I'm, I'm like, all of those people were attorneys. They don't have no ears on me. that part, that part. So what are you yeah. A&R for right now specifically? Like, what do you? What well, do you- the idea with Candid, I mean, it's all relatively new, but to, it's to try to find uh, people that are really merging jazz with hip hop. And, and Ooh, that's uh, fun assignment. Yeah, exactly. But this it's a it's a catalog label too. And and we're not gonna say no to certain cool records. So the first record that I got done happened to be a live record with Wayne Shorter, Esperanza, and myself. Oh and um so that's gonna be coming out uh, in September, I think. Okay. And and then I have a new record that will be coming out on it too. And then I um the other person I signed was Morgan Garen, who's been playing in my band uh but he's like a program dude it's not necessarily hip-hop but it's like i don't know it's kind of like if you took wayne shorter and and then had him like today and programming and using you know all of the right uh, things that are available today you know so I, I i have so many questions but since we're just going all over the place um as a professor coming full circle now to, back to berkeley um do you find yourself in a position? So the, the, the year that I left NYU, I, I did NYU for like four or five years. And my last year, I kind of had an oh shit moment when I realized that my students knew more than I did. You know, we were talking about, I think my last class, I, I believe we taught about Thriller. Mm-hmm. And they had a lot of uh, uh, sort of like a, a synth questions like synth choice questions that I had to do extra homework on. I realized like, yo, these kids are smart as shit. Like they know more than I do as a professor, especially with where music is going in now. Um, even if you are, te- I, I don't know specifically the, the class that you're teaching at Berkeley, but you know, there's so many levels of musicianship as far as like, you know, gospel chop musicians and, and sort of, broken beat musicians i i guess now there's lo-fi <laughs> kind of that genre of music whatever how in your mind do you still feel do you feel not, not do you feel as if you have something to contribute but do you sometimes feel like a stranger in a strange land with the way that musicianship is approached now um uh-huh. For instance, I have a I have a member uh, in my group right now who we don't know exactly how to describe what Stro Elliott does. True, where he plays a drum machine as if he is Tykowski or like a piano player, mm-hmm. where he's playing samples and whatnot. So, with this whole new generation of musicians there, like, what what is teaching a student at Berkeley in twenty twenty two henceforth? when Mm -hmm. it seems that now is the time when the rules are being just washed away and new rules are coming. Well, I mean, that's really interesting because that taps on a few things for me. Um, I try to stay around young musicians. I mean, everybody in my band is younger than me and people that wrote in a different way than than I do. Um, And Mm -hmm. and, and I'm talking about the social science band. So if you, if you heard that record, I think it definitely mm-hmm. pointed to something different than I would have been able to do on my own, you know, because of the, the writing and, uh, and the players, you know, like Morgan and, uh, and you know, Matt and, and the ideas of mixing other genres, like, you know, somebody like Matt Stevens mixes more indie rock, Aaron Parks is, you know, like, he's into classical composers you know, Morgan's into, you know, more of a kind of new school jazz. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I had Casa overall, who um, is not really with us anymore. Kokai is doing it, but Casa, uh, you know, is definitely kind of into more of- Love Kokai. Yeah, jazz meets hip hop. So the idea was to 
for me to recognize kind of like you know prince did right <laughs> Mm-hmm. And uh, that's my favorite part about Purple Rain is that Prince was like, finally, like, oh, like, let, you know, I need to, in order for me to remain relevant, I have to let Wendy and Lisa write, you know? So right. for me, that was kind of like my reckoning with, I'm going to do much better, you know, with this kind of collective. So I feel like I've always tried to keep my ear and my, my spirit to what's happening now even though I can't do it like you know like they do you know I never had gospel chops as something that you know, I just never did it never went to church mm-hmm. never you know played in church and never developed that kind of technique and I don't really hear the drums like that but I can see how you know listening to this younger generation how it has influenced me to some degree you know and um so as far as a strange, strange, strange land, I don't really feel that. I feel like I'm constantly being fed, you know, and it, it kind of, in the end, you know, comes up my way and I still feel like I can comment, you know, and, and on so you're still there. a student at Berkeley. Yeah, absolutely. You're still I'm a student. always a student, always a student. Okay. But you know, well, what it also taps on though is how jazz education has screwed up jazz mm-hmm. because what I'm dealing with mostly are people that come out of jazz programs and now the people in the jazz programs are mostly affluent um you know from certain cities i don't know like it's all over really but people that had programs in school and jazz was kind of more street music you know i mean it was from the people (laughs) And their yeah, experience. It wasn't, it wasn't in academia. Exactly. So the academia, they started, you know, they, they were able to codify it in a way. And then, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Make, make money from mm-hmm. it. You know, monetize like, it. Yeah. Monetize it. But there was another word. Uh, modify. Modify it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, I feel like now to get into a school, you have to be on this certain level and have gone through this system, mm-hmm. which is, you know, is still dealing yeah. with you know it's yes it's, it's, it's prohibitive for a lot of people yeah and it's a racist sexist system yeah. you know well, so and income based <laughs> classes that's what too. i mean that's yeah, why classes, it's racist yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Class, well, you know there's a certain side of musicianship that i'm seeing now with younger people in which um they're able to do whatever fly to the bumblebee levels of speed and literally just packing everything in the first one minute. Whereas when I tell them to do something like my, my dad had a trick where he would make musicians just play a ballad, play something very simple. And man, they will all fall apart one by one. They would just like fall this. Like if you ask them to play T for two or, or chopsticks, it was like (laughs) asking them to play rights of spring. So as as a teacher, do you find it that more students are now in this we're in an era now where like, you know, your your Instagram stories is 15 seconds, like your your TikTok is 30 seconds, like you got to have all the impact of an entire performance in 30 seconds. With, you know, they don't believe that much in space or quietness anymore, like have is is there such thing as a drummer who just play straight ahead and gives what's required or are you dealing with like more gospel chops people that have to like have bells and whistles and fire eating and everything <laughs> fire eating i love it um I so I'm, do- what i'm asking is how do you separate i don't know what your personal preference is i know for me i want a drummer to show me that they know the pocket first mm-hmm. then give me all that bells and whistles and stuff later but yeah time feel is the most important thing period right for a drummer like if you don't have a time feel that feels good then nothing else really matters no matter what the genre you know and then it needs to be you know i'm into playing free these days you know i was just kind of where my head is but there's time in that you know it's not it's not like free means absolutely no time uh and i think the people that play free the best are ones that have good rhythm um, but as far as the students are concerned, um, I don't teach drums anymore. Uh, I haven't done that in uh, probably like six years or so. 
Uh, I just have ensembles. And right now I'm, I'm the artistic director of an institute, um, but I do have two ensembles in that institute. And so I'm just dealing with the overall sound of the, of the group more than individuals. Uh, but it's the same well, thing with all the instruments, what you're saying. And well, uh, that, okay, that, that to me even, I guess I could get more specific with the question is is the I, I, idea of community playing where less is more is that hard to convey now to a generation that feels like to me all-star games are the most boringest games ever in basketball because the score is going to be 200 and 197 like everybody's you know gonna try to show off whereas a golden state warriors in boston sorry by the way um, <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> it's, it's, it's literally about teammate and you putting in your 20% and him putting in his 20% and doing a hundred percent. Is that harder to convey on, on students now, as far as ensembles concerned? Well, I mean, sometimes I'm actually asking them to play more because that's the, the part of me that is like old school and jazz, like, you know, like you gotta, like I'm finding that a lot of them can't play consecutive eighth notes and construct lines that are interesting. You know, they've gone into this, like moved into something else. And I think they're using too much space sometimes. Like what you're saying, I would have thought like a little bit back in the day where everybody was just blazing all the time. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's tiring. I get tired of listening after, you know, a minute or two. That's why, I, that's another reason why I don't really, listen too much or prefer to listen to the gospel chops drumming because i'm bored after i you know it's just i, I get bored you know because right. i'm not a geek a drum geek you know so i don't really care about that right. and i think at the end of the day that's what your job is to make the listener care right what is it that why do we even do this you know so if, if you feel like it's to make them groove that they care you know that's a, a level of care right um mm -hmm. But I also feel like, you know, kind of coming out of the Wayne Shorter and Herbie Hancock book, I think it's about touching uh, the humanity in them, you know, exploring what it is that you share in common. So how do I inspire you? That's my humanity mm. uh, relating to your humanity. And so that's where my head is. And so sometimes when I'm listening to some of these young musicians, I can't get past their sound, let alone the notes, you know, because there's nothing in their sound yet. There's no pain. There's, you know, I don't hear the joy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I try to get them to, you know, go back to the beginning. Like I, I remember uh, once being um, on some, I got honored and it was a, I can't remember who it was, but it was a pro ball player. Uh, must have been for the Patriots. And because it was in a Boston event. And he said, and I'll never forget this because this is uh, well, how I feel too in music. But he said, you know, he was an all star in college and then when he got to the Patriots, they said, now let us show you, you know, how to throw the ball or how to <laughs> catch the ball. Uh, and he had to like go back. <laughs> deflate it a little bit. We'll and then. The <laughs> burn. <laughs> yeah, wow. go back to the basics. So for me, that's the same with sound. You know, like, why is it that Wayne Shorter can play one note and break your heart? You know, True. Like, True. it's about what you're projecting. Sure. You know, so the greatest compliments I ever get is when somebody said, damn, somebody else just played that drum set. But then when you played it, like, wow, you know, the sound changed. <laughs> and that's when I know I'm, I'm that's right. That's what, because <laughs> it's the sound is your spirit. Right. You know what I mean? I would say probably uh, the Mosaic Project is one of your most beloved projects. Could you tell me about just the whole concept of, of doing that album and and gathering these uh, these women together to, to do this album and, and how it came to fruition? Yeah, um, I did a gig in um, Israel. I had a gig in Israel called Esperanza. It was the first time, well, the second time we played together. And uh -huh. uh, she was still like, she had come out of Berkeley and started teaching at Berkeley. And that's when I met her, her first year teaching. So I called her and Jerry Allen and a saxophone player from Holland, Tinika Postma. And when we play, I realized it was the first time I realized I called three women for a gig just based on the way they played. I didn't realize 
that it was three women and this right. was going to be an all women qu quartet until after I had, you know, booked them. So it wasn't anything I was trying to do. I just wanted to play with the three of them. Mm. And I was like, okay, this is a big deal for me because throughout my whole career, people had asked me, oh, could you do this women's festival? Could you play with these women? And I was kind of like, you know, <laughs> when I look at somebody like Mary Lou Williams who didn't want to play with other women, she's like, well, why would I want to play with them when I'm playing with the best? You know, and, and <laughs> I was like, wondering yeah. how you felt about this. Go, ahead. yes, okay. We kind of patronizing thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I shied away from it my entire career. And there was always be somebody like, you know, I played with Ingrid Jensen, uh, or, you know, Rini Rosnes with Wayne, uh, with Bernard Wright, you know, rest in peace. And rest in peace, um, yeah. And uh, there was always a woman here or there, you know, Jerry back with, with Embase and before that actually, but never all together, you know, and I really shied away from it. So I did it and then I said, this is a moment that I really want to uh, celebrate and shine some light on. So I started with just the four of them and then I just kept adding people and it just became like 21 women. And that's really just how, how it started. And I wasn't really trying to make any kind of political statement other than, oh, there are a lot of amazing women that play and let me just put through this record, you know? So this is how the sisterhood started then? Because yeah. I was gonna ask you, is there a sisterhood in, in well, I was gonna say jazz, but really, of course, jazz when it comes to musicians you know as, as, of a sisterhood in that way but i mean I there, you... there is but there's a lot of women uh that are playing jazz that still they they think about it uh how do i say not as much like a sisterhood because you know we're affected by the patriarchy too right so women yeah. are invested in it yeah they don't want to play with other women because they feel like it's a step down but as more greats are coming out of the fold how does it be how is it a step down to play with Terry well, that's, well, that's the, well, I mean, that's the point that, it, that it's only going to happen. That's why I started an apprenticeship program, yeah. a mentorship program at New Music USA, because there's a lot of mentorship programs, but apprenticeship means you have to put them on the stage with you. Mm -hmm. okay, and good. so we got a grant of $1.25 million to hey. do this three-year program. And we had 86 applicants this first year and we picked seven. And so like I, I did pairings. And um, so some of the mentors are Bobby McFerrin and Wayne Shorter and, you know, uh, lots of different people, but some of the, the apprenticeships See. are with Chris Potter, uh, uh, Linda Mejano, um, Esperanza, okay. Marcus Miller, he took one, one, Alexis, which is great. She's having a blast playing with him. So I just feel like I thought, how do we get more men to hire women? Because if they don't really do it on their own, because they need to, you know they, they don't necessarily know that they need to contribute to this, this shift. how do we so, get them so i said pay them you know <laughs> but once the men start out. hiring women then the women will start hiring women well, no, no what i mean is once you know everybody has to be invested in gender yeah. equity because it's, it's for the good of everybody yeah and i just felt like the, the one way to get people interested is is have it affect their wallet. If they're getting a free musician and getting, uh, you know, a little money on top of that, it, it might make it easier. And yeah. it's, you know, so far kind of work, you know, this is our inaugural year. Um, but anyway, I think that this last record though, Waiting Game is the one, it's the only one I can listen to. Let's put it like that. The other ones I can't, what? I can't really listen to. What? But yeah. Waiting Game, I can still listen to. So I think okay. that's for me my favorite of all the albums I ever made. No, I love it because I don't cringe when I listen. To so it. you're still like in your head about like I could have did that better, or we could have did a big different take, or yeah, or just sometimes like Mosaic Project, uh, the first one. Uh, I mean, I like things on the second one too, but the the Mosaic Project, I think the the playing is good overall. Um, there's like some sound things, like, you know, some production things that really bug me. But, um, mm. you know, playing's good overall, but it's a little bit far away from where I am as a musician. There's a little bit of my writing that bothers me, you know, that I'm like, oh man, mm. I, I could have really developed that idea much better. And I've improved as a writer since then. Um, so that's what, you know, but overall, I think, you know, the playing is okay. 
Oh, so you you're writing to- these lyrics on waiting. I'm sorry. I just realized you're saying you're writing these lyrics on waiting game. Okay. okay. Well, you've been also singing on all of your records. That's you. You've sung on it since your first album. You've sung. Yeah, except this last one, I didn't. You know. But okay. um, on Waiting Game, I didn't. But uh, I wrote all the lyrics. Yeah, on Waiting Okay. okay. You, but you, um, yeah, try to sing a little bit. <laughs> you also got to um, man, you you got to to I I guess bucket list check a project um before she died um maybe like six months before amy winehouse died uh she was stalking me daily telling me that her and i were going to redo money jungle and yeah uh the uh, the money money jungle album from uh duke ellington uh and max roach and and charles minkus the the famous trio record that's and what I I did that record. Are you I know, and you wound up pulling it off. <laughs> so we we were planning me, her, and most deaf, and a few other musicians were going to cover the entire album. Oh my god! Really? <laughs> right, and she, and she passed away, and ah oh man, I I was just heartbroken. And then a year and a half, well, for the for the fiftieth anniversary, you actually what made you want to cover that entire album? Because when I so seen bizarre. it, I was like, yo, what the hell? Like That's it came wild. out. <laughs> but I wasn't even mad at it. But what, what made you want to cover that album? Um, I You know, people ask me that all the time. And I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it haunted me. I don't know what made me choose it other than it just kind of haunted me. And um, I started reading all these Duke Ellington biography books. And um, it, and I tra- was transcribing, you know, on the piano. And I realized these are all mostly blues-based songs. Probably the easiest stuff that Duke Ellington wrote. And I knew that um, it was as far as I could go, you know, like with transcribing Duke Ellington, a trio record, you know. Right. And, um, That's the easiest. Yeah. And yeah. And, this, and it wasn't complex, you know, in general. So uh, I kept flipping like, you know, some of the songs to the point they didn't sound like it. So even, you know, Christian said when he came to the session, he said, you know, you really could have just called most of these songs something else. <laughs> You know, right, right, and then claimed it as your own. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, I I just I I wanted to make sure that uh, I wasn't bastardizing, you know, Duke Ellington's music. Right. And um, I read enough interviews, like he said, jazz. We stopped using that that word in 1947. He said, jazz. That just means freedom of expression. And so when I realized uh, that's how he felt, then I felt okay, you know, about changing his music to that degree okay and at this phase of your career um and you pretty much have done everything you you've done scores <laughs> you've taught television you've done everything um is there something that you have yet to embark on that you wish to do for this phase of your career right now oh man i'm just getting started as far as i can <laughs> I, mean, I believe doing, you too. I'm mm-hmm. doing so much now that I'm a little pissed that some of these opportunities didn't come before I'm, you know, I'm a little tired. I'm 56. No, you right. ain't. That's a I'll lie. I'm 57 in two months. You look um, like somebody's baby. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I'm, I'm a little tired, you know, and I wish uh, that I had some of these opportunities earlier. Like right now, I can say a couple of things. Yeah. Really? Right? Really? Yeah, Talk, who who does this at, in 50s? Like, I, I've been waiting for this at 20. I think this is the time exactly. you're ready. At least 41, at, le- at least Wait, 39. Fonte, say that again. Fonte, yeah, say it again. You got it now because you're ready for it now. If you got it in your 20s, you would have fucked it up. Hello? Well, not Terry, but maybe Amir. Right. Yeah. Nah, everybody would have, everybody fucks up. She started time. so early, so I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we're wiser no, now. I, no, but I hear you. Uh, <laughs> I hear you. I, I, I feel you because I feel the same way. And Honestly, I, I hear what you're saying. We're wiser and maybe we're doing it better or different. But and I feel smart. like it's smarter. Yeah. But I feel like I'm the same person, really. I, I, you know, 20 years ago, I would have been going on 37. Mm. Even 15 years ago, I, I would have had more energy. And mm. I feel like I knew most of the things that I know now. I just have a little more confidence now because I'm older. But if I had gotten up opportunities because the way I see it is there's a lot of and I say this when I talk to young women that feel like oh we, we, we're not ready to be in the 
if they're at North Texas or something, they say, we're not ready to be in the one o'clock band. I don't want to get the opportunity to play in the one o'clock band when I'm really two o'clock band material, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's a lot yeah. of marginal white men that have ha- had these opportunities, mm-hmm. you know, like that weren't ready. Mm-hmm. And why do we have to be like three times ready? Oh, we have to be super dope. No, we, that's just a, the program that way, right? Like, right. So that's what I resent. I resent yeah. not having some opportunities when I was in my 30s and 40s when I really had the energy. But now I'm, you know, I'm burning a candle, I'm writing, you know, projects, writing words, you know, like I'm writing a children's book, I'm, I'm doing some uh, film for a, an ex- exhibition uh has so, anybody approached you about a something about your life because there yeah, is, is no there one ever about or? you there's nobody like you in the world like this is no no it's, nobody's approached me yet about that um, no memoir no i'm just trying to get my dad uh he was gonna like start because he has a better memory than me and he's 84 interview your dad right now yeah, yeah exactly. that's what i'm doing i'm currently in yeah i'm starting i'm gonna interview my mom like just i think generally like everyone should just interview yeah. their elders and get all the stories out so that way that they're they're preserved this is long overdue i thank you so much uh for coming on our show you got to come back because i've skipped so many so many questions i had about your career no uh, let's do a part two because yes. i want to hear about tia fuller lester bowie diana oh, Crawford, man. Everybody. Lester bowie. yeah no, yeah. that, 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 this existing. will turn into a Jimmy Jam episode. I, yeah. I assure you. Like yeah. Terry is actually like a four-hour episode on the real. Thank you for existing, Terry. Thank Just you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. No, and that's real. Uh, like you, you, you know, I saw you drumming Matt early, and and you know, you were you were the first kid that I saw doing what I wanted to do for a living. That was that was really inspirational yeah. to see. And I, that's I thank pretty you for wild. That. I I never would have imagined that in. Um, really, I, um, that makes me feel really good. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much. Thank we you. weren't alone. Yeah. Uh, well, on behalf of Laia, Sugar Steve, uh, Unpaid Bill, and Fontigolo, this is Quest Love. And we will see you on the next go round on the next episode of Quest Love Supreme. We'll see you. Peace. <laughs>